God's peace to you in the name of Jesus. A message this evening based on the second lesson from Revelation 7. It was a night march, and the American squadron was walking along in single file, keeping their spacing between them so that they wouldn't be bunched together and be an easier target. There was a scout out in front of that line, and there was a medic bringing up the rear. One second they were walking along. The next second, lead was whistling by their heads, and tracer bullets were lighting up the night sky. One of them, one of the Americans, a specialist and a team leader, quickly started racing toward the enemy fire. His body armor stopped one bullet from ripping his chest open, sort of knocked him on his can, but after he got back on his feet, he was firing rounds like mad. And in the midst of all that, in addition to that, during this firefight, he estimated afterwards, he threw about 30 to 40 grenades in the enemy's direction. And every time one of those grenades exploded, he would use the cover of the explosion to keep advancing against the enemy. He finally crested a ridge, got on top of the ridge, and noted that two of the enemy soldiers were leading off the injured, wounded American scout. He killed one, wounded or killed the other, reclaimed his comrade, applied first aid, waited for help to come, until finally the scout was medevaced out. Sal Junta of Iowa was with the 173rd Infantry in the Karengal Valley in Afghanistan in 2007. He became, a few years later, the first living recipient of the Medal of Honor in approximately 40 years. But since the scout and the medic both died that day, that activity that gained, that gained him the Medal of Honor, that became for him nothing but, well, what he would describe as always being the worst day of his life. A day that he would never have an easy time talking about. I don't, have, I, don't, I don't know if you have stories of your own. I don't just mean stories you can tell, because obviously that didn't happen to me. I don't know if you have stories of your own, like things that happened to you, true stories that are too tough to tell. The original readers of Revelation did, because the Romans were savagely persecuting and killing Christians in their day. However your troubles might compare to military combat or religious persecution, please understand that visions of heaven, like we have before us in the second lesson tonight, visions of heaven are not only equated with someday. They are for the right now, for every trouble and trial and challenge that you can name. Of all the people who are coming together for this Synod Convention in the year 2013, be they in this room or watching these proceedings on streaming computers, tablets, devices, 
of all of them. Let it be said that they heard and believed and acted on the fact that the forgiveness of sins and joy and the strength to go on and the certainty of a good and glorious future are found in Christ alone. Our convention essayist got in touch with me a few weeks ago, gave me an article. It told how there was a church body who had a hymnal committee, and they wanted, if you can imagine, I can't imagine, they wanted to change the words of the opening hymn that we sang in this service. They wanted to print in their hymnal, till on that cross as Jesus died, the love of God was magnified instead of the wrath of God was satisfied. Now, of course, it rhymes and all, but other, other, than, other than to say that it rhymes with Shrespeterians, <laughs> their, their name can remain unmentioned. But apparently, that group of people that was working on that hymnal thought that there really shouldn't be an association with Jesus giving his life on the cross and the wrath of God against the sin of all mankind. And it's not surprising because we would like to edit the wrath of God right out of the picture too. We would like to edit it out of the hymnal, and we would like to edit it out of the Bible. Psalm 24. We make use of it during the Advent season and on Palm Sunday. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Who may stand? I'm going to emphasize that a couple times. Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart anger-free, slander-free, how about that one? Grudge-free, lust-free, sin-free. Short of that, short of that, you and I would have to deal with God's wrath. Revelation 6 is depiction of Judgment Day. The very last verse of the chapter, right before 7, starts, obviously, of both God the Father and God the Son. Last verse of that chapter, it is said, the day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? The Lamb of God who reigns forever and ever is fuming when I call upon myself in the day of trouble, when I do everything I can to get myself through the trouble, and then I honor myself for getting myself through the trouble. Who can stand in his holy place? If you, O Lord, Psalm 130, if you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, you know the question by now. Who could stand? If the Lord himself came into this room as a record keeper, now that would truly be a story that's too tough to tell. There would be no survivors. Not a one. There would only be the screaming and shrieking sounds of souls being sent away from God forever. And the chief of sinners behind the pulpit would be the first one to go. Who can stand in his holy place?
here is an extended answer for that question. There are believers in Jesus whom you and I have known and dearly loved who are not on this earth anymore. There have been Christian sons and brothers and fathers who have been killed in combat in faraway places. There have been dear Christian mothers and daughters and sisters and aunts and grandmothers who have suffered through and ultimately succumbed to breast cancer. There have been tragic accidents which have produced gut-wrenching phone calls which have informed loved ones that their Christian loved one is very suddenly now no longer alive on this earth. There have been faithful parents, Christian parents, who prior to death have experienced mental deterioration because of Alzheimer's to the point where their children's faces became unrecognizable. And who can know how hard that all is for as long as it might extend unless a person's been through it? There have been faithful Christian spouses who've said goodbye to the person they promised to be with till death parts them, and then death parted them. And it hurts down deep inside because that person is no longer at their side. And they still miss that person terribly, that husband or wife. They say it's, you know, they say it should never happen. It should never have to happen. But there have been plenty of Christian parents whose children have preceded them in death. It is not my intention to turn a conventioning opening service into a time for tearful grieving, but I think you know who it is that you start thinking about when the conversation goes in this direction. Maybe, maybe we weren't ambushed or shot at today, but we do know how much it hurts when our lives are touched by trouble or decimated by death. It hurt just as much for first century Christians when they saw or more likely heard about how their dear Christian loved ones or even their Christian family members were killed in unspeakable ways. But against the backdrop of all of that death, Jesus says to John, look, look. Through the grief that you have known, through the tears that you have cried, right, th right, right straight through the most terrible moments of all the days of your life, the, those terrible moments that you don't even want to speak about or think about anymore, Jesus says to John, look, those dear Christian loved ones of yours are not dead. Roman persecution did not make an inglorious end of them. They were not defeated by disease, nor are they now subject to any pain or any other such thing. They're alive as they can be. And in answer to that question that I tried to emphasize a couple of times before, who can stand? Well, look at them. They are standing right now before God in heaven. Therefore, first word in 15, that verse, I know you don't have it in front of you. Therefore is why they can. It tells us why they can stand. For this reason and for this reason alone, by the words that they say, by the clothes that they're wearing, 
It's as if those glorious saints in heaven that you heard about in the second lesson, it's as if they all had come as a group, maybe on one of the MLC buses, I don't know. They, it's like they all came in a group to New All, Minnesota. And it's as if those glorious saints themselves scored the words that are on the entrance to the chapel. Solus Christus. It is in Christ alone that we are standing before God, before his throne. When the death of a Christian loved one is what messes with your mind the most and what stresses your faith the most, this is where to look. Look what Jesus, the Son of God, did for them by giving his life for them and by bringing them to trust in him. In Christ alone do the saints transition to glory. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you. Of all the people, of all the people who've been born, who've lived on this earth since Adam and Eve started having children, of all of those lives that have in some cases been only occasionally t touched with trouble, but in other cases have been nothing but trouble, of all of those lives which had the most terrible moments of all of the most terrible moments and the and the most horrible hellish days including military combat of all the horrible things that have ever happened to all the people of all of history and and have ever happened to, to all of you of all of those most horrible things that have ever happened to anybody in this sin-wrecked, sin-crazy world, of all of it, Jesus Christ had the worst day of anyone. The incriminating, damning guilt of everyone in one cup and on a late Thursday night and on a spring Friday, he drank it all. Jesus had the worst day of anyone. And he had it for everyone. The Son of God absorbed the wrath of God to reveal the grace of God, to make us the children of God. There is no sin on your record. I don't know who it is that will end up getting the came the longest distance to convention award, but even if you just got that one, if you, even if you came all that way and you just got that one sentence, it'd be worth being here. There is no sin on your record. There is only God on your side. Take that you wretched, lousy troubles of this earthly life. I don't know where you are, wherever you are, whenever you come. If you're listening right now, I hope you are, troubles of this earthly life. You will never convince me that God is against me. In Christ alone do the saints persevere through trouble. Revelation labels all of this earthly life as the big trouble. Just another way of saying the great tribulation. And look once more, if you would, look a little bit closer as the elder focuses John's attention on one of the details of that vision. He says, who are these? These are the ones who are coming out of the great tribulation. It's as if, it's as if John could see individual Christians exiting the big trouble, one after another. It's as if he could see one by one, every time 
a Christian died, that Christian leaving the big trouble and entering the glory of heaven. And how about, <laughs> how about that glorious group of people? They see God with 2020 vision. They serve God without a sinful nature. They are not using sunscreen because they do not get sunburned anymore. Food and drink are only for enjoyment, not for survival. Sickness and sadness and sorrow and death are on the gone and never coming back list. And what Minnesotan or maybe Midwestern Christians anticipate the most, the production of Deep Woods Off has been discontinued. Would you look at that vision? Those people you see there, Jesus brought them through all the troubles of this earthly life into the glory of his own presence. This earth is the big trouble. This vision is how God makes sure that the troubles don't swallow you up or bring you down. You know when the Wells Connection starts and you hear that music? And it's the music that in our church body anyway we've been using now for about 15 years or so for Jerusalem the Golden. Da, 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 da. It's almost like the Wells Connection starting, isn't it? And you hear that music. I'm told that President Schrader had something with picking out that tune for the Wells Connection. It's a good one. But think about the words that that brings to mind every time you hear that tune. Jerusalem the Golden, with milk and honey blessed. The ha. I'm trying to see if anybody mouths it or not. Three words. The sight of it. The sight of it. That's what we have in the second lesson. Finish the sentence. The sight of it refreshes the weary and oppressed. Jesus brought them through the big trouble into glory with himself. It is preposterous to think that he would do that for them and not for me and you. You're being previewed in that vision. It's like you get to watch the trailer of the movie that you're in when you see Revelation 7. There you are. Jesus is bringing you through that great trouble, and one by one, when, when the day of your death comes, there you are making the transition to glory. This is your future, and it's shown to you to strengthen you now. A synod which rightly concerns itself with a multitude of issues here is invited to have in, in its vision, in its sights, that multitude of souls there. We know that they're there because of Christ alone, but if we can use this language, those who traveled there along a Lutheran pathway. You know what I mean by that. They're there because of Christ alone. But those who are there who traveled along a Lutheran pathway, they may be, I don't know, they may be a smaller slice of the pie, relatively speaking, of all that countless throng that's there in heaven. But they are, without a doubt, together with all the people who are there, they are God's blessing on the preaching and teaching and mission work and witnessing which feature the message about deliverance in Christ alone. I know I've, I've pointed you there a couple times and I've said to look, but I want to do that one last time. Look at that glorious group of people that are described as being with Jesus in heaven. They are the best results that the good Lord gives to this church body. And they are the result 
of one man's truly heroic service. As it is said on occasion to veterans, let it be said and sung and shouted to Jesus, thank you for your service. Our best thanks is to again take up the work, the work which proclaims Christ, through which his people are brought through trouble into triumph. Soli Christo Gloria. To Christ alone be the glory. And all the angels gathered around the throne said, Amen. Please stand.